Thanks, Michael, and uh, thank you all for being here. So a um, couple times a year I try to get together with you, and end of the uh, calendar year seems like a good time to, to do that and catch up on a few things. First thing, uh, happy holidays to everybody in here. Hope you have a great uh, holiday season. I know a lot of you will be in Charlotte for part of that, so we'll celebrate together. Um, want to mention just a handful of things. First one is the two troopers, uh, Abe and Caden, that were uh, shot in the incident in Martinsburg. My, my thoughts and prayers go out to them and their families during this time. So, uh, you know, during the holidays, usually a time you're celebrating and getting together and uh, just two brave young men going in and doing their job and uh, praying for a uh, full recovery for both of them. So um, very excited about our news yesterday with our volleyball coach. Um, uh, coach Greeny is a very accomplished uh, coach, and I made the comment to our committee, you always go into every search with multiple plans, um, A, B, C, and D. Very rarely does plan A work. It's usually a stretch plan, but this one it actually did. So really excited about her. You'll get a chance to Zoom with her later today. Uh, very, very proud of our men's soccer program. Um, Coach Strafford's a great representative of, of the institution, certain one of our own, um, just does his job, doesn't complain, doesn't ask for anything, um, and just has a great culture in that program. So we're very, very proud of, of them. Uh, excited to be going to Charlotte. That happened uh, at the waning hours last minute. And so, um, you know, and, and uh, I know that's one that our fan base is excited about. Uh, every time that I uh, look or see anything on ticket reports, um, it looks like we're going to have a great crowd there. So can't wait to, to have Mountaineer Nation show up there. And then want to just mention briefly women's basketball. They, they're they playing today uh, at 2 p.m., but have started the season off on a really, really good run. 10-0? Um, and 0? Got a chance to be 11-0 and 0 today. So. Um, if you didn't have a chance to see the education uh, game the other day, there was a young lady from the other team uh, that had 37 and was as hot as I've ever seen a, uh, a, a player in an opposing gym. So we were able to win the game and you got a chance to see a, kind of a once in a lifetime performance from, from her. So that was exciting. So with that, uh, I will open it up. Uh, we can talk about whatever is on your mind. I know, uh, uh, President Charlie Baker put a proposal out there. We may talk about some. Uh, we had a court case that caught a little bit of attention here in the state of West Virginia and, and affects the transfer rules. So whatever you all want to talk about, we can talk about. Great. So to start with the, the, the court case. Might as well begin for there. So your thoughts, do you think the NCAA comes back after the spring and, and comes up with another proposal on multi-time transfers. What's your assumption on, on what's going to happen there? Yeah. Um, well, first, Greg, towards the end of the football season, there was a press conference, and I think you felt ill and you weren't here. And there was sheer confusion about what we were going to do when it come Q&A time for Coach Brown. Was there not, Michael? Mm -hmm. Nobody knew what to do. I didn't think there was going to be any questions. Um, yeah, so – First of all, I would say I'm generally supportive of some type of regulator um, on transfers. Um, you know, at one time, there was a year of residency for all transfers. Then we introduced the grad transfer, which made a ton of sense to me. Then we gave the one-time transfer. So uh, that all made sense to me. The restriction on more than one-time transfers is, is not there to keep the student-athlete from having options. It's there because... Um, of the desire to graduate student athletes. And so if over four years of eligibility, you're, you're transferring multiple times, it makes it really difficult to uh, get a degree and to get a quality education. Um, I, I think probably the biggest misstep is when you have a subjective waiver process. And so once we granted the one-time transfer, in my opinion, we either should have had no waivers or an objective criteria where you either meet it or you don't, but it's not a subjective process. Um, and so we'll see what happens in court. Um, you know, the NCAA may lose the ability to put on any regulators, um, and, and we'll just see how that happens. But, you know, my hope would be that, that there, would be, there would not be a subjective process uh, involved because what that does it forces the student athlete to make a decision without knowing if they're going to be eligible or not. Um, 
And uh, to me, that's just a risk that shouldn't have to be there. We, we should be able to determine now, are we going to grant a waiver? And, it, and is that waiver, w what would trigger it? And there shouldn't be any subjectivity to it. For multi-time guys other than maybe a real strict criteria? I think that would be one, sol one solution. Um, and it would be a solution that, that I would generally be supportive of if, if it met the legal challenges. Um, because at least then everybody knows. You know, a student athlete's educated, they know up front, I get a one-time transfer and then a grad transfer. So that's really two times that you can transfer. Um, I think what, but what makes it really difficult is, um, hey, here's these waivers. And, you know, historically, they've been pretty reasonably easy to get. And everybody knew they were going to be harder to get. The NSA was clear about that. And the reason why they made them harder to get is the membership asked for it. Um, but uh, – but st nonetheless, you have this history of them being pretty easy to get. So it put a lot of student athletes in a really difficult position. And um, so that, that would be my solution. Either, either you don't, there aren't waivers, or if there are waivers, it's an objective. Here are the things that you will get a waiver for, and it's automatically triggered. Yeah, Ryan, you have a basketball uh, coach, an uh, interim coach in there. Uh, and he's kind of going to war. Uh, against the AR forty sevens or whatever, whatever those things are, with uh, three bullets. Uh, how do you how do you evaluate? How do you judge a guy in that situation where, I mean, he really doesn't have much anything yeah. to him through no fall of his own. Yeah, um, I think what I would probably say to that is the general public and you all, for for that matter, um, it's like an iceberg, and you see the tip of it. You see what happens out there on game day. Um, I get a chance to to see the entire uh, the entire iceberg. Like I'm there every day. I know uh, the, the behind the scenes of the battles that have uh, that have uh, been faced. Some that you're aware of, and some that you're not even aware of, right? And so um, I, I think, um, just like I've said with football before, I get the focus from the public on wins and losses because it's the only metric they really have a window into. Um, but I, I get a 360 view of, of everything that goes on in the program. And so, um, you know, my, my goal is to uh, do a pretty thorough review of each of our programs at the end of the year. Um, in terms of men's basketball, I mean, they've only played a third of their games. So they still have two thirds of the season left. Um, it has certainly been a season that's met full of challenges. Uh, I've been clear that I think that um, Coach Eilert's handled uh, m most, if not all, of those challenges well. Um, and he'll have my full support uh, throughout this season. And at the conclusion of the season, we'll, we'll decide where we go from there. You, uh, uh, he's only through a third of the season, but you're through your first year here now. What has that been like? I mean, it's, it, I, I know in your wildest dreams, you couldn't have dreamed that your first year was going to be like this. It's been a, it's been a, a, a certainly a crazy first year. Um, you know, I've, I've lost a little weight, uh, but part of the deal is if every time you go to eat, you get your phone rings with some kind of crazy thing happening, you don't, uh, you don't eat as much. So um, I, um, I think for me, I always tend to look at the positive aspect of things. And so the challenges that we've been through have really given me a chance to build deeper and more meaningful relationships. And that goes from our student athletes, to our coaches, to our administration, to our board, to our donors and, and fans. And so in that regard, I'm actually grateful uh, because um, you know, we've probably dealt with five or six years of challenges um, in, in a year. Um, and uh, my family, I've said this before, they have loved being here. People have treated them incredibly well. Um, we've been welcomed, uh, welcomed here and, and made to feel at home. Culturally, this is very similar to where we grew up um, in rural Oklahoma. And so, um, you know, it's been a, a challenging year, but, but it's also been a year where I have, I've felt like I've really gotten to know the people here. Have you been able to put the organization together that you wanted to or have all these distractions kept you from being at the place at the end of one year that you wanted to be? Yeah, I, 
we've we probably haven't got as far on some of the planning um, and, and and strategic initiatives and strategic vision planning that we would like to. But we've we've made a lot of progress, and that's happening uh, behind the scenes. We have a steering committee that um, is uh, going to meet after the first of the year and start to really drill down. Um, we do have a a, uh, a staff realignment uh, reorganization that uh, we've internally we know it already um, we just are waiting until after the first of the year to announce it um, but um, so so we've gotten most of the things that you would have wanted to get done in the first year done or or or, or in process um, and so um, I think we've made given all of the challenges um, really good really good progress on all of those things yeah, Ren, um, looking at, at Jen Green can you put into perspective how rare it is to even have the chance to hire someone with her resume? Yeah, in 20 years, it's by far uh, the best resume uh, that that I've ever been able to to hire, and probably the only one that would be close is when I was at Northwest Missouri State Division II. Um, I hired Coach Kellogg, and and he uh, came from Fort Lewis uh, uh, College, I believe it was Fort Lewis, and he had taken them to. Um, the final four maybe even was national runner up. And so um, from a D2 to D2, that was a, a, a huge coup at the time. Um, but, um, you know, I, I know there'd been, there's been a lot of high, high level programs who've tried to get her interested in their job over time. Um, you know, she was at her alma mater. Uh, you know, she played there from there. Um, I think. Um, Washington State and Oregon State have, have been dealt a really tough hand in, in realignment. Um, probably um, got her to be more considering of other opportunities. Um, and we, you know, we, we had a, two processes going. We had a process of trying to recruit her and a process of vetting other candidates. So, like, we, were, you know, we met other candidates um, and had some people we felt really good about. Um, but, um, you know, it was always kind of, if we can get her, this is a no brainer. We got to get this across the finish line. And so, uh, we actually were able to get that done. And, um, I think it says a lot for, uh, WVU, a lot for the new big 12 and, and how we're positioned, um, in that, in the new conference. Um, and just a lot for, uh, really the sport of volleyball. Like, I, I, I don't know if you all saw this or not. The, the uh, final four in volleyball did over a million and the championship game did a million seven million seven so to put that in perspective um, football programs really good programs won't average a million seven viewers for their for their linear uh, games for the course of the year um, so that's I mean that's those are monster numbers and that sport is growing unbelievably so it, it's a sport where we wanted to to invest and, and we wanted to send a message and I think it did. How did you even, you know, when, you, when you're in the search committee, how do you even think to, that she was available? Um, well, I always use a search firm uh, for, for one thing. Um, and then what we do is um, I will take the search committee and I'll say, hey, you're assigned these conferences and we are going to look at in mid-major conferences successful head coaches who we may have interest in and then in power conferences we're going to look at high major assistants who've had a lot of success or if there's some reason that a high major you know a power five uh, head coach would be gettable they have a tie here they're an alum here whatever the case may be let's put them on the list and so we are developing our own list, and then we're doing that independent of the search firm because I, I want to cross-reference those to see um, where their list and our list are the same. I um, mean, they have a lot more connections, right? And they get a lot truer opinions. Somebody doesn't mind to, to tell me a, a, a story to help, you know, as a reference for somebody they really like. But you don't want to do that to a search firm because that comes back around later on and, and can hurt you. So uh, they're able to get really good uh, opinions. So we had Coach Greeny on our list because we knew, you know, hey, this may be a time that it makes sense to reach out to, to her. Um, and then um, when the search firm was doing their due diligence, they thought it was worth a phone call uh, there as well. So 
Um, the initial call I made was to her uh, and uh, talked to, to her AD and let him know I was going to make that outreach. I, I still, a lot of people don't do that, but I'm old school in that way. I think it's the right way to do things. Um, and uh, it went from there. Mike? Um, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, you guys put out the RFP for upgrades and improvements. And I think the big item was probably luxury seating suites, whatever you want to call it in football. Um, how would that look? Do you think, and then just in that RFP, what else do you envision across the athletic campus? Yeah, the RFP is really for the broad facilities master plan to look at our entire footprint, um, and, and they'll come in and they'll interview our coaches. They'll they'll take a subset of our student athletes. They'll talk to our administrative staff. They'll talk to some fans. They'll talk to the colleagues on campus. And and the way I always view it is, I'd rather it be. Um, more uh, than less in terms of uh, let's put out the big uh, vision that's out there that uh, who we want to be when we grow up and let's pretend for a second that money's not an object like let's but everything that we'd need let's let's get it out on the table and then from there we would develop uh, that the the facility master plan and start to plug things in but not in a whole lot of detail because you don't want to spend the the cost to go into great design work and get uh, actual drawings and cost estimates because all that costs money and then a year or two from now it's not worth anything because the price of things have changed so um, so most of those projects will be just a basic rendering and and really the most important thing is figuring out the adjacencies and where you want to put things um, but the one thing we do want to want to run out a little further uh, is is Pushkar Stadium um, I've been clear that um, you know, we can raise revenues here. Most of our revenue streams are up, um, but premium seating at Pushkar Stadium is a hindrance to be able to grow our, our budget to where it needs to be. And so uh, that's something that is very prominent on, on my radar. Um, I don't have a plan today for funding and building that. Uh, and part of that is I don't know exactly what we want to build and what the cost of that would be. Um, but uh, but the facility master planning process and, and that RFP that's out there, and um, I believe they've had a, probably a dozen or so firms that submitted a proposal, and those are being reviewed even now. Um, but that'll help with that process. After some initial back and forth with, um, with Huggins, it's been very quiet for a while. I'm imagining it's not been silent. There's probably been communication, but where do things stand as far as a resolution or contractual obligations or just – Maybe that's completely tied off now too. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to speak with uh, with Coach um, since shortly uh, after uh, he stepped down. But um, uh, as far as I know, it's it's there's been nothing new. So I, I think uh, it's fairly resolved. Um, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Um, I have a lot of respect uh, and appreciation for what um, uh, Coach uh, did here, and. Um, you know, and, and, and there probably will be a time and place where he and I'll have a chance to catch up. I, I, I think he's been busy with things. I've been busy with things. And I just hadn't had a chance to, to visit with him. Was there any type of transaction as far as like owing him what he was paid beyond what he'd already made? Or is it just that when he, when he was, however he did leave, that was it. There was no money. Correct. No more salary. Yeah, there's been no additional okay. payments. Chip Kelly talked about kind of treating football as a separate entity in college sports. Would you be someone who's in favor of kind of having a general football conference and then everyone else, or do you think all sports should be more tied in together? Well, listen, if we were putting this together today, there's no way we would do it the way that it's done. Like, this is insane. Um, so, in theory – would I be uh, okay with with having a football affiliated conference and then everything else in other conferences? Yes. Um, and in fact, I would argue, pull football out, let's affiliate by conference there and have a system that's not that much different than most states do with their high schools, you know, district, regional, area, state. Um, to me, that makes a ton of sense. Um, but, you know, conferences are so entrenched in the power structure and commissioners are, 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 are very powerful. And so, you know, it's like, you watch Game of Thrones? 
are you too young to have watched Game of Thrones? Is, is we, have we went that fast? And, um, so, uh, you know, like, it's pretty rare for kings to give up part of their kingdom without some kind of fight. Um, and so, like, could that happen? It'd take a lot of people to come into a room and put their personal, um, you know, territories aside and say, let's, let's do what makes sense here. And, you know, I'll say this. Football is the primary driver in, tel- in, in media deals, but, but it's not the only driver. And so there would be a give on the value of basketball packages in some leagues if you, to, to do basketball with, with other leagues that may not draw as many eyeballs. And so, um, you know, when you look at TV, really it comes down to – and streaming's becoming more popular, but linear networks still fund the vast majority of, of the deal. And so it's – how many linear networks are there? And then how many windows do they, does each of those linear networks have in, in the course of a day? And so you just add up that inventory, and that's what's being split up. So um, you look at uh, our men's basketball TV schedule this year. When it came out, there were some fans that were upset because they felt like um, we, we didn't get the respect that we had gotten previously because we had more games on ESPN+. Plus. It has nothing to do with, the res- with respect. We had 10 teams and we went to 14, next year it'll be 16, we have the same number of windows, right? And so every time you add, um, then then there's going to be less linear opportunities per school on average. And so so when you start to look at all of that and you start trying to divide that up, getting everybody to say, oh, we're going to push our chips to the middle and and do some other um, deal, it's just harder than it seems. So in theory, do I think it would be a good idea? And if we were starting from scratch, it'd be a great idea like the practicality of getting everybody to, to do that, I think it's tough. And I think in the backdrop of that, the bigger issue we have is, is the whole revenue share question, um, which Coach Kelly's model really doesn't necessarily um, speak to that. Um, I think it's going to happen in some capacity. The, the, the thing that, like, that I think escapes a lot of the general public is – the revenue that comes into college athletics, the vast majority of it is football. Uh, then men's basketball brings in some, and then other sports bring in some too. But it, but but you have to understand there's a difference between um, having revenue and and being profitable, right? And so every sport has revenue of some kind. There's not very many that are profitable. And so when you look at the sports that are actually profitable, it really comes down to you know a couple. And so. Schools are bound if you if, if you distribute funding to distribute that in accordance with Title IX. So you have to distribute for, for whatever you distribute to, to male athletes, you have to distribute to, to female athletes. And so if you do that and you revenue share in accordance with Title IX, you really haven't stopped the criticism of these two sports are not getting their fair share and the antitrust issue. So when we talk about needing federal legislation, those two – it's like two locomotives and they're pulling in the opposite direction. And I, I've not heard a plan that satisfies both of those. Uh, and so, um, when you look at what governor Baker did, I think he threw a plan, uh, into the sphere of consciousness for people to discuss, um, knowing that it would create a lot of discussion, some for some against some confused. Um, but I think he wanted to get a discussion point out there that shows what we could do. His plan is title nine compliant. Um, but but would require some antitrust protection. Um, but but I do think um, it's fair that that we should be challenged to to provide more benefits to student athletes, um, and I'm supportive of that. Um, I just don't have a great answer for how you do that with with all the regulations that exist today. Greg Perry, two first year basketball coaches right now, one obviously with an interim tag, the other without. Can you just kind of compare and contrast how different the evaluation process is, and particularly on the men's side, without you know really having the full complement of a roster for probably yeah. the first 20-plus games? Um, yeah, I think they both have, have uh, done a good job, uh, presented you know two totally different um, uh, situations, both challenging – uh, in their in their own way. I mean, you look at Coach Kellogg, he, he come into a program uh, that he was the third head coach in three years. Um, and uh, 
the the his predecessor left after one year. That was left those student athletes pretty emotionally raw. Uh, I was with them when they found that news out. Well, they found out on social media, but within a few hours of them finding out and had some candid conversations, and there was a lot of emotions um, in that room. Um, and so, you know, he had he really had to come in and build trust and build equity. Um, you know, had to bring in a lot of players, trying to get them on the same page. Um, so then you, you, and I think he's done a really good job of that. Um, Coach Eilert, uh, not totally different, but different. Um, I, I, our staff will tell you this. Um, I always knew that the challenge was great. Um, and I told Coach Eilert that. I think I told him, one of our last meetings, I said, I almost feel guilty considering putting you in this position because I know how hard it's going to be. You know, you've got a lot of new players, uh, student athletes coming in. Um, you know, you had some guys who had been here uh, and were probably hoping to play. Like, just no matter if there was not a coaching change, no matter who was coaching them, it was going to be a big coaching job when you take that many new people, a lot of them that are in their last year of eligibility. Um, they're coming here trying to have a good career most of them wanting to go pro or having aspirations to go pro. They don't know each other. They haven't played together. And you're trying to get those guys to be a team, right? And so just that would have been a, a monumental job. Um, then you take uh, the coaching change, the transfer portal opening, um, some more roster fluctuations, um, you know, not being able to get waivers uh, for, a couple, for a couple of the kids, um, injuries, uh, you know, there was one that uh, Coach Eilert moved on from. And so you just take all of that, and um, it, it's certainly been challenging. But I go back to, um, you know, you, you can't just judge because of all those things. It's why when people push me wanting a number for football before the season, it's why I don't give a, a number, because there's just too many things that go into all of that. So maybe the recent round of conference realignment is, is stopped for the short period, but history tells us there'll be another one in five, seven, ten years. You at some couldn't point. let me rest for Christmas, Greg? <laughs> no, can't. So, I mean, you know, obviously Washington State, Oregon State have been crushed. How confident are you that West Virginia isn't in the future in, in that predicament? They've had spot at the table to this point, but is that going to continue? I'm confident in where our positioning um, is. In a lot of ways, we're the gateway to the Northeast. Um, I've said this before, we may only have a little less than 2 million people, but we are West Virginia's Dallas Cowboys. Um, and so of those 1.8 million people, 1.6 million are, are following every possession. And so when you look at the valuations and you look at the viewership, um, and, and they're just in the last few days released the viewership numbers for all the Power Five teams, we're always like right there in the mix. You know, we're not in the top 10, but, but we're in the top half in terms of, of uh, the valuations and, and what we draw from a viewership standpoint. And I think – because of our population, it not being great, it shows the power and the reach of our brand, right? And we we can get into the Pittsburgh market. We can get into D.C. and Baltimore. Um, you know, we have a, a, a broad uh, reach. And so um, for all of those reasons, I'm just very confident in our positioning from a conference perspective. Um, the other thing I would say is, this program and this university mean too much to the state and the people here. I've learned that like the people here just won't let it not get what it needs to get. And so um, people are like, well, are you worried about Charlie Baker's proposal? And it would probably cost us an additional eight to $10 million. No, because we're going to figure it out one way or another. We are going to figure out how to compete at the highest of levels and how to provide whatever uh, is allowed per NCAA rules that will allow this program to compete. Um, I'm not going to let us not do that. I understand the pressure and the responsibility that comes with this position, but, but also West Virginians aren't going to allow that to happen. 
um, our leadership at the board level, our leadership um, at the state level, our leadership here at the institutional level, like it's just not going to happen. What, whatever the highest level of college athletics is, we will be a participant and we'll be competitive. I think you went on the radio a couple weeks ago and, and basically crushed any doubts about Neil's job. Um, just how do you view the football program as it is right now versus you know when you started this time last year? Yeah, so I was coming in last year getting a lot of questions about football, and um, you know I always try to. Uh, you guys have seen me enough. I'm always going to be calm and exude confidence, but that, that's hard when you're getting questions about something and you. You don't know. You weren't here. You know. You're trying to. You're trying to answer questions, but I have spent a lot of time around the program, um, with meeting individually with all the coaches and most of the staff. Um, you know, I know most of the student athletes. Um, I've been to a ton of practices. Um, been in the locker room for pregame, halftime, postgame. So I have a great feel for for the program. As an athletic director, when you, you, you visit with a lot of recruits and their parents, and I always say, above all else, when I look at a parent and tell them I would want my child to play in this program for this coach, you want to really mean it, right? And, and I can look at student athletes uh, in our football program and say that and really mean it. There's a, so many things that are done right uh, inside the program. And so I'm very proud about that. We got grades a um, day or two ago, and football was right at a three-point um, for the entire team. That's extraordinarily uh, rare to, to have a football team that's um, at a three-point. And so a lot of great things that are happening. But again, as I said earlier, um, the general public's going to judge you by the tip of that iceberg, which is that scoreboard those 12 Saturdays. And I get that, and Coach Brown gets that. We all understand that. And so it was rewarding to see them. Um, you all will find with me I'm pretty honest and transparent with what I say. Um, and so when I came in here back in August, I said, I'm going to be surprised if they don't prove a lot of prognosticators wrong because there's a great culture. They, 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 they're for each other. There's a camaraderie. I mean, I think that's pretty close to a quote. Um, and to see that play out um, is really positive, and I'm really proud of the team and excited about the future. I thought yesterday was a great day with the additions that they brought in. I um, think we're doing a better job um, in, in retention and, and recruitment um, and evaluation of prospects that are out there. Uh, certainly uh, the growth of Country Roads Trust um, is, is a big benefit to that. Um, to see their growth from – they've – doubled their membership um, in, in just a couple of months here. That's incredible. Uh, so all of that plays together, but I, I'm excited about where the team is. think they did a really good job. I'm excited about the future. Trust, are you excited about the, the mayonnaise? Not at all excited about mayonnaise bath. Um, and I'm not like Coach Brown. So Coach Brown hates mayonnaise, right? Like he, like he really hates mayonnaise. Um, and uh, – you know, my, my food like that is pickles. I hate – like, if this was a pickle juice challenge, there's no way. I would be, like, headed to some country without extradition right now. Um, but uh, to be honest, like, so when they were first doing their drive, there was a few people that were uh, tweeting me and stuff wanting to know if, what it would take for me to take a mayonnaise bath. So I literally threw a number out there I didn't think they could get to, if you want me to tell you the truth. I didn't think that we would get to 1,500. Um, so, uh, but we did, and so we'll, we'll pay that bet up. Uh, we got to figure out when and where, but, uh, I do think it's exciting. Um, I just probably underestimated, uh, how much West Virginians love their Mountaineers and, and how many West Virginians like to see, um, fat bald, balding guys covered in mayonnaise. So. Ryan, speaking of, speaking of NIL, I mean, there's a lot of talk that, uh, that, 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 the way it's set up now is not right uh, with the, the trust and with the schools. Not, you know, kind of affects the recruiting and, and, and leaves a lot of room for mis, mis uh, representations, I always say. Uh, how do you stand on that? What, and are, are you guys, would it hurt you to have to pick up the expense of that uh, 
by yourself. Yeah. Um, so I don't have a crystal ball, but my guess will be that eventually the role that collectives play will probably go to institutions. Um, I am... N- I'm not necessarily super against that, but but I'm against it a little bit because we have a really good relationship. So with Country Roads Trust, we have one collective. Um, you know, they're well uh, supported uh, from from uh, certainly Mr. Kendrick and Oliver Luck, but also some other supporters. And so they have a full time staff. They do a really good job. By and large, their contracts are solid. You know, I think they do what they say they're going to do. Um, you know, we're not. Uh, directly involved in that they're committed to compliance you know Oliver certainly knows NCAA rules as good as anybody and so um, so that relationship is working great Um, and I have not seen uh, any cannibalization of our annual giving now we start to try to do a big capital project that could be a little different you know it may there may be some people who um, have, have picked up in supporting NIL efforts that that wouldn't be able to support capital, but it have really hasn't hurt our annual MAC contributions that that people give. If we brought it in house, I think there definitely would be some cannibalization because if people know it's us, they're going to want uh, the benefits that they know we can provide: the parking, the premium seating, the you know the the uh, pecking order in terms of who gets bowl tickets and NCAA tournament tickets and all that stuff, and so. Um, I, I do think there would be some cannibalization that would occur if that happened. So um, right now, um, I really like the way our relationship works, but but it doesn't work that I would put the way that it functions. We're probably performing in the top three or four percent in the country in terms of just, you know, the way that you would want it to function in the way that it's actually functioning. Um, and so. Uh, I understand that there's a lot of chaos out there with other institutions. And so I, I won't be surprised if at some point it's not allowed to come in house. And we have a, a white paper of what we would do if tomorrow then say waved a wand and said, Hey, these are coming in house. Um, but, but I, I do like the setup that we currently have. For the people, though, I mean, they're being asked for uh, St. Jude and uh, the Wounded Warriors and uh, this, that, the other thing, plus the fact of uh, NIL contributions, MAC contributions, paying yes. paying uh, things up for the license fee for seats and things like that. I mean, yeah. there does come a time when they say, hey, I got I agree. kids. So. Yeah, as somebody who has a salary that's published publicly, thanks to you guys, um, uh, I get hit up a lot for all of those charities. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm with you. Uh, the way that I have tried to, to communicate, um, so far is, I might have even used this with you all before, but I know I did as we spoke to caravans and stuff. Um, you go to church every week and you have your tithes and offerings. And then, you know, a lot of times they'll send a plate a second round on mission Sunday or, or whatever for, for another round. And so that's the way I've tried to position this. I mean, I, I've been really clear about where our budget ranks um, in, in the Big 12 and, and our need to grow that if we want to remain competitive. And so, um, you know, we really can't afford to, for, to have that cannibalization, but NIL opportunities are very important as well. And so, um, so far, West Virginians have rose to the occasion, uh, thankfully. So, Uh, Ren, the, the Big 12 obviously underwent some change this year, uh, even more next year. A couple of outgoing, a bunch more coming in. Your thoughts of now that things sort of, you got a good picture of it, and then the scheduling matrix that's come out, you, you satisfied with that? Because there is some increased travel there yeah. that maybe you were hoping to avoid. Yeah, so um, I preferred... Uh, more regionalized scheduling than what we ended up with. Um, there is, if you if you were to analyze all four years, there there is some uh, a hybrid regionalized approach. Um, but what happened was you had some of the new schools coming in who greatly desired that over a four year period everybody played everybody. That wasn't as important to me. 
I would rather ensure that over a four-year period we played Cincinnati every year. Um, um, and so, as I alluded to probably even in, in statements back in August, I had a desired outcome. But I alluded to, you know, what's good for the outliers is tougher for the people who are geographically centered. And so it requires everybody to give a little bit. And so what we ended up was with, was with a hybrid approach where there's a regional component and by and large those regional people you're going to you're going to play more often than the than the others. And so for us there was only one of the four years in football for instance that we had to make two trips out uh, to the west. We're fortunate in that that year there happens to be two buys. And so we're tr having conversations about making sure we split those two trips up enough, one, that where they're not close to each other, but two, that, that the buy is next to, to at least one of them, right? And, and so, um, but, uh, yeah, if I had my druthers especially take football aside in those other sports, um, and I, I mean, Provo, Salt Lake City, that's a beautiful part of the country. If you've never been one, we go out there and play, you're going to love it. It's absolutely gorgeous. I would not send teams out there, um, in, in, in especially in Olympic sports. Um, there were others, and, and let's use BYU for example. So they're um, the only uh, Mormon-affiliated school in the country. They, re they, they want a presence nationwide. They want to recruit nationwide. So they probably have a desire to get in this part of the country as much as possible because that's really important to the mission of their institution. So when you're in a, in a room with um, – with colleagues, everybody puts their desires on the table, and you try to try to find something that that works. Um, nobody gets ex it's like a house deal. Mm -hmm. A good house deal, neither side is feels like they won, right? Everybody had to give on a little thing, a little bit, and so that's probably where we ended up. So overall, I think it'll be a good thing. Um, but but it, if if it was just me in a vacuum, I would have probably went a little more regional on it. But I also understand why we ended up where we did. To the trust, are you able to see or share how Country Roads Trust compares to other collegiate trusts and not only membership wise but just off of revenue they're bringing in and distributing with student athletes? I don't, and I don't get to see their financials, I don't get to negotiate deals. Um, um, you know, I, I know um, enough just watching from afar that it's growing rapidly, and I'm very pleased about that. Um, you know, I, I I don't know. I, I, I suspect it's competitive. Um, you know, I, but I, I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't probably gather. There's not disclosure, so nobody really knows what anybody's doing. Um, you know, what I want to make sure of is that I'm doing whatever I can to help them grow, but, but I've never really asked for a balance sheet or finances. And, and part of that is, you, I mean, from a compliance standpoint, that degree of separation is is protecting all of us. You spoke about regionalized scheduling. You know, any further discussions, talks with Pitt about any, any either major sports extensions? Yeah, um, you know, you get to uh, the academic year, and everybody is so busy and distracted. And this has been a time of of uh, unrest from conference standpoints. You know, the ACC has had a lot going on. They they expanded. So I fully expect we're going to extend that. Um, honestly, every time I see Heather uh, at a, at a uh, whether it's a convention or a meeting or a game or whatever, we're both like, hey, we need to get together and extend those deals. So the spirit is there. You've heard, I think, all the coaches say they want to extend it. Um, we just have to find a little time to, to – uh, actually sit down and hammer out the details of that. So there hasn't been any movement contractually in getting that done, but I have every reason to believe it will get done. Last two, uh, Mike Cazaza. Going, um, just, just kind of picking up a little bit on, you said revenue streams and the, the seeding could be good for increasing revenue. Just kind of took off of that. Where else could you raise prices, for example, rather than building? Where would you not want to raise prices for revenue? And then, you make money to spend money, right? Where would you Where would you like to maybe spend more money? Because your budget, like you said, has to grow. Um. So I think the more premium experiences that we can create, um, 
those are where we can squeeze uh, more money, whether that's suites or club seats or even like the two clubs at the Coliseum. I mean, Club 35 drew, drove revenue for us last year, um, and, and uh, the Clark Family uh, Mountaineer Club is, is certainly – uh, driving uh, revenue for us and um, it's driving revenue in MAC donations required to, to get in there and participate. Um, it's driving revenue and sales uh, in there in game day. Um, we're already getting a lot of interest in people renting that venue uh, to do different things. So it's going to drive revenue from, from that perspective. And then uh, Fred uh, and uh, his family uh, uh, gave us a substantial donation to name that club, which was, which was revenue. In terms of, of expenses, um, that's a pretty broad question, but it's an interesting one, right? Like, um, because you can't afford to not put forth a football and men's basketball product that's competitive. But let's take a – just to pull a number out of a hat, $50,000 in a lot of our sports would make a world of difference in, in – their abilities to function and compete. Whereas you drop 50,000 in football's budget and they probably wouldn't even notice it if you didn't tell them. And so, um, and so like, you know, I do think as part of our strategic vision planning, um, we got to spend a lot of time talking about that, Mike. I'm not dodging that question today, but, but it really is like, Hey, we have some sports that I think we could be nationally competitive for not a lot more money investment. We also know that we have to compete because of, the, the, the revenue that's, that drives a whole department comes from football and, and basketball. Um, how, do we, how do we mesh all that together? But I, I, I am confident that we can do that. Um, and what gives me confidence is you're seeing us compete in women's basketball. You're seeing um, women's soccer has been very competitive. See what happened with men's soccer. And so we just have to make sure that we maintain momentum there, that we're pre presenting what it takes to maintain momentum to our donors um, and they can support it as well. Right, so then, then your two money makers then, are there top of the mind things like coaching salaries, uh, travel luxuries, anything like that that you think could be improved yeah. for spending on those two programs? Um, in those two, I think our assistance pool overall, like so the number of positions were very competitive, but the overall budget for those um, is something we really got to spend some time uh, looking at, um, and that's probably something Coach Brown and I'll spend some time discussing. And as we go in the next uh, next next uh, year with men's basketball, no matter you know where what we do from a leadership perspective, um, you know our our head coach pay um, certainly in men's basketball has been very competitive, um, and it's fairly competitive in football. But but we probably have to look at just that assistance pool and that allocation um, in those two sports because that number has changed rapidly even in the last uh, few years. Um, I don't think we've had a chance to talk to you since it happened, and I don't want to forget it. Um, Coach, what was the process, Coach Maisie announcing his retirement and then getting Coach Sabins as the, the coach in waiting? Yeah, so um, generally I'm not a huge fan of Coach in waiting. Um, and so – Probably in a 24-hour period, that's as much as I've ever given on a position that I that that I felt strongly about um, in my entire career. Um, because if, the day before, I even though I have a very high opinion of Coach Savings and he would have been a strong candidate for for our job, I got just fundamentally there's just part of me. I've just seen too many of those not go very well. Um, and so I just uh, – I'm just not a, a huge fan. Um, but in that particular case, Coach Maisie and Coach Sabins have such a great relationship, and they both came to the table with, with a spirit to, to make it work. I mean, and everybody was given a little bit. I was given uh, up uh, on just wanting to always – I'm feeling like every time we should do a full search and the best candidate should be hired then. Um, without r saying too much because it's not mine to share, but Coach Saban's had a Power 5 job offer on the table. It was his. Um, and, um, and and Coach Maisie um, maybe would have went a little bit longer in a different time and place, but in his mind, Coach Saban was always going to be the successor. Um, and so really it was three 
uh, three guys sitting down talking about um, what what's the best for the program. And I think where we ended up is what's best for the program. Um, and um, I give a lot of appreciation and thanks to both of those coaches who really came to the table um, giving up something that might have been best for them personally to do what was best for our student athletes and, and what was best to sustain the success of the program. And so um, I'm at peace and very comfortable with where it ended, although uh, – of all the things that we've dealt with, that was probably the day I was the most testy because it was just on the heels of a lot of drama, right? And I was thinking we were smooth sailing. We win a baseball championship. Like, let's just solidify leadership here uh, with what we have. And and so uh, it's probably the only day that I was demonstrably agitated uh, in, in my time here is I try to always be, like, um, cool under pressure. But uh, but I'm I, it ended where it, it – uh, where I think it should have, and, and that's a credit to those two. I've got so much respect for, for both Coach Maisie and Coach Sabins, and I think the future is really bright for that program. And um, after the first of the year, we'll have an announcement about um, an enhancement to the facility out there that uh, I think is going to help continue that momentum. So, uh, now Mike's trying to wrap us again. It's what he always does. But I'll, if there's any others, uh, I, I will answer if you guys have anything that you didn't get in. So with that. Would you like to share a closing statement with you like the fans and media to know? <laughs> did you guys, you probably don't watch all of our videos. Did y'all see the video I did with Tony a couple of days ago? So I'm talking with Creedy. He doesn't like to ever – be in the in the forefront or limelight but he's behind us him and sean and they're giving us you know four minutes three minutes well tony is not one that's known for brevity and neither am i so conciseness is not a strength and so it's very intimidating you're getting these answers and and you got somebody counting you down and so we get to the end and mike and michael is wrapping us and so tony just ends the interview and doesn't give me a chance to wish everybody happy holidays and so I stop it and say, no, we're not going to rap. I, I've got some things I'm not done saying. So then he wants Sean to edit it out, and I, ref I refused. I, I don't often play the boss card, but I refused. And so you need, guys need to go watch that video, but he was, he was not happy. Is that true? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll just end by saying thanks for all you do to cover our teams. I know you work uh, extremely hard. Uh, we may not always agree on, on everything, and there's times that uh, you guys write something and, and I tell Michael I don't think that was the right uh, approach to this. But by and large, I think you're very fair to our student athletes, our coaches. You've been very good to me. Hope uh, you all have very happy holidays. I, I'll remove any suspense and drama, Mr. Herzl. I think you'll be lump of coal again. Um, <laughs> So, you know, that way you don't have to wonder. Uh, but in West Virginia, I think a lump of coal has a different uh, connotation maybe than the rest of the world. Maybe that's, the, yeah, the good boys and girls actually get coal. Yeah. So thank you guys. Happy holidays. And uh, we'll see you in Charlotte.